On this episode of the ABB Podcast, we have come all the way to beautiful downtown Chicago. I guess we're not downtown, though, are we? We're close. We're close. We're close. Well, we're in Chicago yes. either way. <laughs> uh, hanging out with Susan and Daryl Wright. How you guys doing? We're okay. doing good. All yeah. right. Thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me out here. All right, AJ. Thank, thank you. Thanks for doing this. Uh, so, Daryl, you and I met uh, last weekend while we were up in northern Michigan. That's true. Uh, you, you, were playing with, you were playing with James Armstrong. James Armstrong, right? Armstrong yes. Yeah, basically okay. James Armstrong. And we, uh, we got to chatting, and... Basically, you told me you were giving me some stories about the, the, the scene here in Chicago. Yes, the blue scene here. It's, you know, it's really quite good. It's really good, and there's a lot of really wonderful musicians that stay here. Right. And um, help still to propel the blues. Tons of musicians. Chicago is still a really great staple for blues. You were born and raised here? Born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. So talk to me about what, what it's like growing up in Chicago. Well, it's, it's you know, the, Chicago is a hodgepodge of a ton of different music. Blues has been the staple. And um, as I was coming along, my dad was a uh, gospel singer. And um, I got involved playing early with him in the church. But uh, one thing about my dad is he took me around to see just tons of great artists who were both, as we say, secular and doing gospel. Right. So I got a chance to see a lot of people really early. And um, I really enjoyed the gospel. And then he, he would listen to blues records at home and jazz. And I noticed the similarity between the two as a young player learning how to play. So um, I started um, really listening to blues and jazz even a little bit more, realizing that it was but they all borrowed from one another. Mm. And uh, one of the great things about um, my coming up is that I grew up across the street from a blues artist named Mighty Joe Young here in Chicago. Okay. And I was able to watch him firsthand at his house when he would rehearse. And I was able to go just right down the street and watch him. So it, I had a great training ground here of, yeah. of, of getting blues and just music in general was really, really good. But that was very, very important to be able to see that that early. Do you know, the, and I'm, I'm sure you do, but do you know the full history of the blues in Chicago? Migration. Yeah. It's part of the migration because a lot of those guys that were doing blues in the South came up here and became electrified. But why, because, so migration came to Chicago, but migration went to Detroit too, and Detroit didn't hold on to the blues the way, I mean, there's a great blues scene in Detroit, yes. and I'm not shitting on that, but it, it's not known for, for blues the way Chicago is. It's, it's, it's the evolution, I do believe, of the sound in each city, like Memphis has its evolution of sound. Right. Austin has its, Chicago has one, Detroit has one, which is Motown. Mm -hmm. But if you listen to a lot of the early Motown records, they're blues influenced. Right. But it's got what we call that soul, that other little ingredient is in there, and they capitalized on it. Right. But we here in Chicago have always continued to capitalize on the blues and, and that format, even though there's tons of musicians here that um, also became very well known as soul R&B mm -hmm. blues artists, Curtis Mayfield, Tyrone Davis, and all those guys, they do soul and R&B. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of here, it's kind of a mesh of the two. But we're really known for the, the blues here. Blues became the staple as opposed to Detroit Motown became talk, the staple. Talk to me about what, it, what it's like being a young man in Chicago finding blues music. And specifically about being a young black man in Chicago finding blues music at a time when black folks are walking away from blues. Yeah. It, 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 that's really interesting because as a whole, we have a tendency, especially this is part of Chicago as well, we have a tendency to, to learn things and then abandon because we want to look for something new. Okay. Okay, and, and it's, it's without realizing that, that what you've done has really been quite great, what you've brought to the table as far as our music and a genre and serving it up is really quite great, but we have a tendency to abandon and try to move on to something new and different. Um, even myself, as a, as a teenager, I played blues and R&B and gospel, and before you know it, I was branching out, trying to play jazz, trying to play rock and roll, trying to play salsa, trying to Latin music, but that's just the learning experience. I still always came back and went, this is all blues based. It all, a lot, so much of it comes from blues. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be very well understood here, that a lot of these things come from blues and it's a part of everything that we do. So it was, for me, it was, that, that has a lot to do with not 
um, how can I say, absorbing and keeping it fresh and alive is that we still need new artists to come in and help to promote the blues mm -hmm. and promote just that, that music form, period. And bring your own flavor to it. Right. Don't do what's been done 40 years ago. Bring something to the table so that they continue to evolve and be accessible to the rest of the public. Let me put a pause on that for a second. Susan, mm -hmm. where'd you grow up? In central Illinois. Central, okay, so what, what's central Illinois? What, 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 what's the city we would know or town we would know? Well, you would know Champaign-Urbana, where the University okay. of Illinois is. Okay. Uh, I grew up on a farm about 15, 20 miles from there. All right. Yes. So tell me about being a farm girl. <laughs> Plenty. <laughs> I know there's a joke or two, but... <laughs> well, don't believe all the jokes here. <laughs> Well, you learn a good work ethic, I, right. certainly, that carries over into everything. Um, I mean, I grew up, you know, singing in, in elementary school and taking piano lessons, and that's kind of where I got my start, I guess, with music and was, I guess, very encouraged to continue singing. So, um, I... Mom and Dad played? No, they didn't. Okay, so no. then where did you pick it up? It just was, you know, the, oh, music, was, the music was in me. I don't know. Yeah. I just started singing. But mom and dad were good? They kept encouraging? Oh, absolutely. Yeah? Sure, absolutely. You know, I did the, the school musicals and church choir and all that. And, and because we had a very, it was a very tiny town, a very tiny church, um, I ended up getting put in the tenor position and learned to sing harmony. Right. Which, I, I mean, I fully credit my experience in, in church choir with my ability to sing harmony now. Right. Um, so that was great. It teaches you that ear, right? It does. Yeah. Ab it, absolutely. So I hear the harmony in every song, whether it's got harmony or not. <laughs> <laughs> when, did, when did music become part of your, like, part of your living, part of your career? Okay, not actually till I was 30. So you're a late bloomer. I, yeah, in, in terms of doing it professionally, okay. um, I am. I sang in the church that I, you know, that I attended there, and the organist, the church organist, approached me and said, you need to come and audition for a band that I'm putting together, which was something that, you know, was in the clouds in my, really? in my dreams. I was raising, I mean, I was, I was raising kids and, and teaching and, and didn't see that as, a, as an option, I guess. So, it was so, then what was it? so then what was it for you if it wasn't a, a career option, just a thing you did on Sunday? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Just, a, you know, a, yeah, an outlet, I guess, if you will. Yeah. Was it not sort of a, was it never presented to you as an option? No, really when I went to college, because I went into teaching, I mean, I looked at becoming a music teacher. But I knew that what I really wanted to do was go into performance. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, my parents, as farmers, were practical people, and they're like, and what are you going to do with that when you, <laughs> when you graduate? So I, you know, I, I so appreciate school uh, music teachers, but that's not what, I knew that's not what I wanted to do. Right. So I ended up kind of turning away from music as, you know, in terms of how I could pursue that professionally. Because I really, oh, you know, one in a million people can do, to do that professionally, you know. So, um, and that wouldn't have been really the, probably the vocal training that I wanted anyway. It's, I, it, it's funny because you two come from like completely, completely oh, yes. back, like completely opposing backgrounds. So the music as a, as a living almost seems like it was the first thing that was ever shown to you. Yes. It was. Yeah? Yeah, it was. So I can tell you a story about my dad. <laughs> How he um, he knew I really enjoyed playing. Right. You know, I, we figured this out uh, like 14, 15, and I, and I was coming along pretty well. And we were watching the Tonight Show, and I'm I'm just kind of watching the guys in the band. I'm learning because they're all playing, so I'm watching. And my dad goes, oh, "You like that, don't you?" I go, "Well, yeah." He goes, "That's the job for you." And I looked at him like, "That's the job for me." He goes, "Yeah, them guys on stage, checks good." They work every day, and they're way up the food chain. But he already knew. He was basically telling me about, you can join a band and try to be successful, or you can become a musician and become successful. This is what you got to do. You want to look for jobs like that. So I was trained in more than one way 
a band's great if you can have it, like any other business, you make it successful, but if the band is not successful, what are you gonna do? What are your options? Your options are to teach, work in the theater. It's different things for a musician to do. He was basically showing me how to be a musician if I wanted to work. That's it, that's a that's an opportunity most kids at 14 years old do Don't not get. And that's what I got. I got from my dad. I got that from him. Did, so was it, did you snap on it right away? Right away. Right away. Right away I read every album, everything that I had to do with playing. I always read who was playing on it. How old were you the first time you got paid to play? 16. Do you remember? Mm-hmm. What my was that? My dad got yeah. me, he got me a job. He was working at the Hyatt Hotels. They had a little Christmas party. And he said, well, my son plays. And they were like, well, yeah, you know, you, 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 that's your dad, that's your dad. I, I know he thinks you're good. Right. So anyway, he told me to put a little band together and they would pay me. I got like three or four of my friends together. We put a little band together. We went in and played the party and that was it. That was my first payday. Yeah. <laughs> Very first payday. And the other side of that is playing with my dad. Um, they had a gospel quartet. And in the quartet, three of them, in, I was related to just about everybody in the quartet. They were uncles or cousins, and we were all related. Right. They also paid me every week. It wasn't much, right. but they said, you're a working musician. We're going to give you something every week. For Not just you've been a good boy, girl, because you're 15, 16, and thanks for coming. No, it was like, he needs to be paid like everybody else. So they were training me. They were really setting up a training ground for me. It, it's funny because I listened to I listened to Buddy's audiobook. I'm yes, down mm -hmm. here. and and he was telling stories about coming up through the blues. And I apologize for putting somebody else's stories on you. That's, That's quite all right. But we love Buddy. <laughs> but the the story you're telling is the opposite story of what most people experience on every step of the way. Why do you think it is that you had that opportunity? I think one of the reasons I had that opportunity is because um, um, both my parents valued education. Okay. And they valued um, the fact that you want to do something, always prepare yourself to be the best at what you're doing. And so see, I was really, really big into music, sports, anything I put my hands into, it was try to be as good as you can be at it. But your neighborhood friends, as you're coming up, mm -hmm. what are they doing? Well, some of them ain't here. Two or three of them play. One of my really good friends we grew up playing with is a phenomenal guitar player, and he grabbed it early. Yeah. And his dad was a saxophone player. Okay. And I worked with him with uh, Mavis Staples. He's a great guitarist and lives here in town. I guess the reason I'm asking is because it's, it's Chicago, right? So it's known as a rough town. I know it's known as a rough town now it's probably rough. more than it was it's a rough then. Town. Yeah. But like, so growing up, for example, growing up in Windsor, as a kid growing up in Windsor, you know your option is basically factory life. You're gonna go work, I see right? You're, okay. you're gonna get into a factory and you're gonna go do some stuff. And I mean, you hear, you hear stories about Chicago and for a lot of kids growing up in this city, there isn't even an option like that. Right. So I just kind of wonder, coming up in the house that you grew up in now, you said your parents, uh, valued education, and I'm sure that's true for a lot of your, your friends' parents, but like in a community where you can value education all day, but a lot of times it's go get a job, go find some money, go find a way to make it. Mm -hmm. Yes, a lot of that. And, and like I said, fortunately for me, my dad kind of tied the bridge together, which is playing is fun, right. but if you're trying to do this and you're going to work once a month and, and, and not work the rest of the month, that's not going to work. Right. He said, so you have, you have an option. You know, you're either going to hold down a job or you're going to get a job playing, which is still a job. Mm -hmm. So he was basically opening doors for me to um, figure out that if you're going to work, you're going to work somewhere. Why not work doing what you like? Yeah. So I ended up playing a lot of different music, but I was employed. Did you, coming through Chicago specifically, where there's so many, because there's, there's a lot of opportunity for musicians in mm -hmm. the city. 
did you run across the because like there's a long running joke on the show where I, I say basically at the end of the day we all know musicians are just a bunch of lazy assholes that don't want to work anyway so they figured out this is what they're doing <laughs> and I mean I can say it and I, I understand what uh, there, I get a little flash slap back on it uh-huh. and I understand that but you know what I'm saying there's plenty of those guys That's funny, yes do you is there a better work ethic around music here Gosh, I think so. I think there's a really good work ethic around here. Yeah. Of music. Yeah. These guys are they're I mean, if they decide to make it full time, they're they're humbling to work six, seven nights a week. Yeah. And the beauty of Chicago is you can do that. You can do that. If you're good enough, yeah. you you know, and you get yourself known. Are you able to do it locally? Like, like, do you st- do you stay around home most of the time, or do you find yourself on the road? Like- I do some road work, not as much. Excuse me, not as much as I used to do. Right. Uh, because Susan and I are trying to, to do things with our band and make it move. So some things I have to sacrifice and not do it. But um, there is a lot of times I'll just I'll even look at the calendar and see what I have, and I'll make my make my um, decisions based on. How much do I have to go to Susan? I'm going, this week here's pretty open, but I got an offer to do this and it. We had one just come up. It was um, the guy offered me like 10 days. Now I came out and said, Look, man, man, we got, I got a big hole here. I need to go. He said, Yeah, let's do that. Right. But a lot of times we'll have plenty for us, and I'll get these calls and, and I won't take them. Some of them are worth more money, but it's not worth it long term for me right. to try to get this, what we're doing, off the ground and but, make it happen. But that's great because you, you have the source right here that's close to home. And that's still, exactly right. right. That's exactly right. So yep. let's let's find you from the middle of central Indiana, in Illinois. Right. Sorry, right. my bad. That's so right. close right here. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> but close. Let, let's, let's figure out you from central Illinois, I almost mm-hmm. did it again, into, yeah. into Chicago. How does that happen? Okay, well, I... Wait, before we do that. Okay. Central Illinois, Chicago's the big city, right? Right. Does it have a little bit of that, like, shine to you coming up? Or did you ever think about it that way? I never thought about it that way, really. No. Okay. No, I I didn't, but, um, I mean, I moved up here. I had lived up here briefly in the late 70s. Um... And then, but that was honestly uh, before I started singing professionally. So okay. I wasn't really looking at Chicago in that right. in that manner. Then I moved up here for um, uh, a school administration uh, job in early two thousands, and was you know was already playing a lot. So then, of course, you want to get get yourself known or start networking with people, you go to jams. I mean, that's where you meet other musicians, you know. When, so, did, when did you decide that that was a thing you were going to be doing? Because up until you're 30, or are you already a professional musician? No, I'm already a professional okay. musician. Okay. I'm just okay. so I skipped, teaching. I skipped a big chunk. There was a big okay. chunk, but yeah, I, I started then from the time I was 30. I was in bands always gotcha. after that, but it was my second job. It was my weekend job, right, right, you know. Right. Yes. Thing you did for fun. <laughs> well, yeah, and I mean, the, the you know, for a second job, the money's great. Yeah. Uh, it was late at night, so I had young children, but they were usually on their way to go to bed. The time I even had to leave, so leaving them with a the babysitter was not a guilt thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it was really like the perfect, the perfect second job. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, I mean, I used to. Well, the first band I was in was a complete variety band. I mean, we did everything from old jazz standards to to uh, what was popular at that time, which would have been the in the 80s, early 80s, uh, and everything in between. And then I had grown up, and my home was country western music. There you know, there was two kinds of music, country, country and western. And, western yes. yeah. <laughs> and so um, so then I had a country band for several years. Um, I'm a big Patsy Klein fan. And then as I got older, because I used to have a really high, clear voice. If you you had a high, clear I voice? high, clear voice, yes. And Sorry, this lady has like the deepest growl I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> yeah, I used to be a soprano and a really clear voice. And I don't smoke, so people always say, oh, you must be a smoker. I'm like, thank God, I was never a smoker. Can you even imagine? Be fair yeah. To me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um, anyway, when I moved up here, I was already, people were already saying, you know, you ought to try some, add some blues songs to your set because your voice is really kind of sounds bluesy. Yeah. And so uh, I had started to, to do some Bonnie Raitt and some things like that. And then when I moved up here, I mean, you know, you just immerse yourself in the blues, really. And I'm, I just, 
I mean, that was it for me. I just was completely in love mm -hmm. with, with the blues. So I really just kind of made the move even more and more to, you know, my band was already sort of a variety band at that point, but I just kind of kept just moving sliding more and more, over. sliding it over, more and more blues, less and less of everything else. And that's it's where my voice fit. It's what felt good to me. Um, you know, I... I feel it and then that's what people always say I can just feel it when you sing and that's important to me yeah. um, that that's because that's part of the you know getting the song over so here moving, I am moving into music when you're 30 years old mm -hmm. when you decide you're going to take it on as like a thing thing right is that a midlife crisis no absolutely not First of all, because it was for me, I was I was forty. But, okay, I was, well, 30, 30, I was thirty-six. Thirty too young for midlife crisis. Right, right. Um, no, to me, it was just being presented with a like it's like the goose with the golden egg. I felt like I had been handed something that I never thought I was going to have the opportunity to do, and I I was just giddy with excitement, you know, and and it didn't conflict with my day job and it didn't conflict with my children and it you know just kind of fell in. it just fell in and I was just over the moon excited so it just went from there now did that start in Chicago or started outside of Chicago? no that started in Champaign okay yeah. and, it was, and that was the, the the variety band that was the variety band okay. right yeah okay and so when you get to Chicago you start immersing yourself in the blues how do you how does that happen to you well, I was just interested in getting to know people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people who already live up there said, you need you need to go to these jams. Here's a bunch of the jams. You know, that's where you're going to meet musicians and um, let them meet you. So that's just what I started doing. And, and I mean, it's just the networking is everything around yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. it really is. So it How, just Did grows. it take you long to, to kind of get yourself involved in the community? I don't think so. I... I'm, I don't know, stubborn, persevering. Let's say what persevering. Persevere. Yes. yes. And all the other words. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Whatever persevere. positive life yeah, that yeah. is. Yeah. I mean, if I, and I know what I want. I'm, I'm going to do whatever I can to make that happen, you know, with, within reason. So, sure. So, yeah, I just. I guess my question was, was the Chicago community accepting of you? Very. Yeah? Very. I, you know, it always bothers me when people talk about how musicians are, you know, just so into themselves and territorial. And there are a few. Mm -hmm. There are a few. But overall, it is, to me, like a big family. And they, they are open and welcoming and kind and friendly and, and uh, all of those things. So I actually, when I moved up here in the early 2000s, then after a couple of years, <laughs> I made the mistake of moving back to central Illinois for several years. But I kept coming up, not you know, every few months or whatever, to the jams. And, and he made sure I kept all those connections and all those friendships. So then once I was down there, I was like, oh, that was a huge mistake. Now i got, now I got to move back up there. <laughs> so about four or five years ago... Um, the opportunity presented itself that I I could make that move, and also all my connections were still there, all my oh, musical friendships and so on were still there. So that made it a lot easier, you know. Other than being there, new managers at the bars and new owners and all that stuff, but as far as musicians, that was that was tight in there. It, it's funny to me because in as a as a musician in Windsor, Ontario, right? So right across the border from Detroit, Michigan. Um, your only real option to make a living as a musician is to find yourself on the road. Like you can, there's there's a handful of us that are like the local, you know, like I'm a play in the corner, you know, cover band guy Absolutely, on the yeah. weekends. You know, I do mm -hmm. that, you know, that's how I make my living. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a handful, like maybe five or six guys, well, maybe a little more than that, um, in the area that can, that can make a, a full-time living doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but outside of that, if you're going to make any kind of, if you're going to pay any bills with music, you you're going to get work. on the road. Getting a road work. And it's, it's just interesting to me that you guys are in this place where that doesn't necessarily have to be the thing you're looking at. Does it change the way you look at what being a musician is? Mm. Well, really not for me because it's, it's uh, see, there's, 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 well, there's two things. There's being part of a band and trying to make it successful, then there's being part as a musician. Yeah. And, um, I think that when you are 
train yourself in your craft. That's how you make things work. Um, my grandfather was a carpenter, so I saw him do lots of work for different people all the time. I thought of myself as a bassist the same way. Lots of work for different people all the time. Right. But you got to prepare yourself. And if you prepare yourself, it enables you to participate in the genres you want to participate in. Because, like as I said before, you got to work anyway. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to work to make a living. So it's going to either be that road work or you're going to be a journeyman around town doing different things, participating in different um, musical formats. You're going to be doing, or you're going to have this, what we call a straight eight. What's a straight eight? You're working eight, nine, oh. five, <laughs> straight eight. Yep. So you're going to be, you're going to make some money somewhere. Right. And I, you, if you have the opportunity to play and still receive a salary, yeah, I can say you're very fortunate because everybody doesn't get that. Well, I know lots of guys that don't have the opportunity to play full time because the income's not there. What's the part of the job that everybody forgets? <clears throat> oh, God. Loading in. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the part you want to forget. I don't think anybody yeah. forgets that part. No, the, the crowd does. And, right. Oh, the crowd yeah. definitely does. People, but I, mean, I mean, as the musician coming up, like, what's the, what's the work part of it that, that you, you know... You have to rehearse. You have to practice if you want you to be rehearse. better. You, you don't get to a place where, oh, you know, I, I'm, You're I'm top dog, I'm it, I don't have anything else to learn. Mm -hmm. He's literally the best musician I know. And I thought that before we were together, okay? Right. He's literally the best musician I know. He practices every day. Every single day. Okay. There's a reason he's the best, but he always feels like he has more to learn, more to grow. And... You know, sometimes we run into 20-year-old kids that are, I mean, they're pretty good for being 20, you know, and they're getting a lot of attaboys, and, but they are, they don't want any suggestions, they don't want any critiques, because, you know, they've made it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I worry about them, honestly, I, because once you feel that you've shut down your opportunity to grow anymore. I don't you know. know. I, don't, I mean, I, and I don't know the particular people you're talking about, but I think in a lot of ways, that's just youth. I think a lot of times as kids, we think, and I mean, some adults are just waiting to get to that point when you're done. Like yes, that's a thing, right. Right? right? Instead of seeing the whole thing as a journey. Right, right, right. Yes. Yeah, you're yeah. just trying to get to that, okay, I'm, I'm a musician now, I can go to bed. <laughs> you're exactly right, you are exactly right, right? It really is, it's, it's pretty amazing, man, because I, you know, you see, you see some of these people that do this, and um, they, 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 they like these guys 19, 20, 21, what is amazing about all of that is that I grew up with guys. We were all 18, 19, and 21 and could play. Mm -hmm. For us, it was like, well, that's what you're supposed to do. Not, good job today. No, it was, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be as good as you can possibly be. And sometimes the pat on the back is a mistake. It's not, an, yeah, they don't take it as encouragement. They take it as I've arrived. Right. Mm -hmm. No, you haven't arrived. Right. It's encouragement for you to keep going on doing what you were doing. And that's, I think, the big mistake that is uh, made sometimes with younger players is that they think they arrived. See, I never felt that I arrived. He still doesn't think he's arrived. <laughs> but coming up in the blues scene, and this is just, again, back to Buddy's book and, uh -huh. and you know, some of the story. Coming up in the blues scene is, is, is especially back in those days, it, there, there were no pats in the back. As a matter of fact, it was more likely to get a kick in the ass than a pat on the back. Absolutely. So like, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rough business to get into. It's a rough business to get into. You don't want to get into this if you're thin-skinned. Mm -hmm. Don't get into this business. <laughs> Do not get into this business and don't become an actor. <laughs> you're thin-skinned, stay away from those two. Right. Yeah. So, so talk, to me about, talk to me about entertainment as an industry in this country. Uh, there's a... Uh, how can I say, for the most part, in parts of the industry, people hear with their eyes. They don't hear with their ears. Okay. It's visually, how can you be stimulated, not with your ears? Okay, so that means that there's two types of entertainment out there. There's the crowd that's gonna come because they don't care how much dancing you do, they come to watch you play. Right. And present the song. Other people are out here, we know that that's the vast majority. They want to see you bouncing off walls, doing backflips. They that's and that's entertainment. Mm -hmm. 
unfortunately, um, there's there's also a middle ground for all entertainers is to if you do what you do, it will be accepted. Don't do what you don't do. Which is if you don't do backflips, you don't flip the guitar, you know, don't do it. It's not what you do. But if you're comfortable doing that, it's an enhancement mm -hmm. of your performance. And I think that that's, that's a real positive when it comes to selling yourself and selling music, is if you have that kind of quality, use it. Get as much out of it as you possibly can. If not, do what it is that you can do and then try to do it as a whole and, and make a presentation that way. Set up your show so that it is entertaining if you're not the joke teller. Mm -hmm. If you're not the front guy who can just whip it out there, give them a show. You how, don't have to do that. How much time do you spend thinking about the show versus thinking about the music? Um, I mean, you're a bass player, so at the end of the day, you're usually the guy sitting in the back just holding it all together, watching the other guy jump off the walls, but... <laughs> exactly. You know, I... I um, Probably depends whether you're the musical director of the band or not, That's true. Right? Yeah, yeah, it really does, because I, I, I think that the uh, the entertainment value is, is, first of all, always smile. Never look like you're having a bad time. Mm -hmm. Never. And some people don't like to do it. Well, I don't smile when I play. Well, you, you got a mother and a father, don't you? You got a sister and a brother. Don't they make you laugh? Mm -hmm. Once in a while, think about them. Think about the things that make you happy, and they will. you will share that with the audience. You're not sharing everything with the audience when you don't, when you don't how you gonna, smile. How are you going to smile with the blues? How do you smile with the blues? Because you're telling the truth. Right? Yeah, because you're telling the truth, you know. Blues ain't all sad. No, it ain't. And there's, there's something about getting a message and you know the message has been done and it, there's a feel good about it. Because you've put this message across and you feel, that's what makes you smile. Mm -hmm. That's what makes you smile. You feel good about what you just presented to people. And it could be the saddest song. <laughs> But you feel good about the delivery. You've delivered them something and entertained them. That's what makes me smile. That's what makes me smile on stage. So, how did you start falling in love with the blues? Well, like I said, people, you know, had started suggesting to me that I, that I look at some blues songs, you know, because my voice was just headed in that direction. <laughs> it was getting deeper, it was getting raspy. And so I started with Bonnie Raitt, and I, oh, I absolutely love Bonnie Raitt so much. Um, and then when I lived here, and then was kind of more immersed myself in it, I mean, I just, I fell in love with it all. I, I just, because... Is it the music or the mystique? It's the feeling. To me, it's the feeling behind blues music. Because, um, I mean... If you're a real blues player, there's got to be some passion behind it, you know? Like I said, I've had people suggest songs to me, and I'm always happy to try and learn a song that someone suggests, but it, once in a great while, I just don't feel the song. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to put on a, a great, I mean, I'll, I'll sing it all right, I'll be in key and all that, you know, but I have to feel the song. And the thing about blues music is that it's easy to feel that because it's about feelings you you know mostly gives you that opportunity to scream a little yeah you know. a, a little bit but it's song. just yeah um i don't know you just i can't explain it because it just comes from way down inside mm -hmm. you know and um, you're an educator right you're a teacher right retired or, okay yes, yes so that's how i get to be do it full time now right right <laughs> but, but my question there was did you feel emotionally stifled as a teacher? I, I loved what I did as a teacher, too. Um, I worked with kids that had a lot of emotional and behavioral problems. Okay. So it was all about developing the relationships with them, you know? So I, I got a great deal of satisfaction out of what I did as a teacher. So I got to do what I liked during the day and then do what I... And it really likes it okay. time, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so no, it was great. So the, the kids that you dealt with, do you use those experiences at all? Um, probably on a, like a subconscious, subconscious level. level. Yeah. yeah, I mean, some of them, well, most of them just had horrific childhoods, you know, and uh, just a lot of heartbreak in, the, in their daily lives. Mm -hmm. 
and and the blues is kind of about heartbreak. <laughs> so how did how did the two of you come together? And I'll, I'll let you guys decide how the story gets told. She can tell you. Okay. <laughs> She's um, on the floor. I, before, right before I moved back up here for good, by the way, I just said um, I was temporarily staying in Springfield. Uh, which is also Central Illinois, and my, I, have, I have a son uh, and his family who live there. So they, uh, for a small community, they really have a very strong blues fan base okay. and a, a strong blues society there. So there's a, a club that every Monday, it's Blue Monday, at the Alamo, Blue Monday at the Alamo. Yeah. And so I would always go down there on Mondays, and I had met him several times because he came down from Chicago with several different bands on a different Blues Monday. You know, we, and then usually toward the end of the night, regardless of who's playing, it would be a, it would be a musician's jam toward the end. So I'd be going up there plugging into his bass amp, you know, would say a few words, whatever. And then. Um, we really never got to know each other really no. well at that point. We, we knew who each other was and that kind of thing. Well, then, as I was literally going back and forth, moving things up to Chicago, I went down, I came back down to Springfield, and they were filming a video mm -hmm. at one of the clubs in Springfield. And I also knew the guy that, James Armstrong, that he was working for very well. Right. So I was like, I wanted to go support that. So I went to watch them make the video. We think that James was trying to play Cupid. I think he was. In retrospect, we think that James was trying to play Cupid. That is great. Knowing James now? Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. I okay. Yeah. Because he came up to me and said, oh, I'm so glad you're here. And he goes, make sure you tell Daryl who you are. I don't know if he remembers you. <laughs> of course, you know, the, the little diva in me was like thinking, how can he not remember me? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I was like... Well, okay, it was also kind of a humbling moment, you know? Right. So I was like, okay. So a few minutes later, Daryl walks by me because they're on break. And I said, hey, you know, I want to say hi. And I'm Susan Williams, in case you've been. He's like, oh, I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> and we ended up talking yeah, after that gig for like two and a half hours oh, wow. that night after that gig. And then he was going to get a train back up to Chicago. And I was like, I'm taking a load of my stuff. If you'll help me unload the car when we get back, I'll, I'll take that's it. That's the truth. That's how we... And, that's, and that was it. I mean, literally, that was it. We were just together. Another that. fucking roadie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, AJ. Yeah. You got it. So I, it just it was just like an In incredible that connection that we made yeah. at that moment. How long has that been? Coming up, four, on, coming four up on four years. Yeah. Mm, it's, yeah. It's not fresh. No. Yeah. It feels fresh. Yeah. Well, there you go. So tell me about the music. When did it? When did it start being a part of the relationship? I'm guessing fairly early on. Well, really, I mean, yes, music has always been right there. Um, it was so funny though because people would say, "Oh, two bass players. That's so cool." But too bad you can't ever play together. Right. Daryl looks at me and he goes, "Yes, yes we can." We can. So yes, yeah, talk to me about yeah. So talk to me about this because I haven't really got. I, I saw a little bit in there, but that I guarantee you that isn't close to what you guys normally do. Right. So, tell me about the uniqueness of what it is that you guys do. Okay, so I just play the, the bass line and sing. That's my thing. That's what I do. He plays parts all around me, and I'll just let him explain. Yeah, you know, basically what I'm doing is um, taking the bass and using it to color the songs differently because the, the, the bass guitar there's a lot of things you can do with a bass. You play five or six string? Both. Five and six. Okay. And five he's got seven string. Oh, seven <laughs> and, and what it is is that you take the instrument and it's all about shaping the sound. Okay, so Susan has one sound on the record. My sound naturally got to be different. Mm -hmm. or you won't be able to tell what's going on or it'll sound like chaos. Don't kill them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can still tell that I'm playing bass, but the tone is different. Right. Okay. And then a lot of the parts, I will write parts that you could sometimes could play probably on a, on a guitar or on a keyboard, single note parts. They don't have the texture that the bass has. Right. That texture is just different. As you were listening to some of the one note stuff I was playing there against and what Susan was playing, my tone was completely different. And I didn't run into the other three guys. Right. When did you... How did you start picking that up? Um, really, it was... It comes from jazz, 100%. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I yeah. love jazz. Yeah. I love jazz. And I'm a big... Always have always been 
first of all, the most frustrated singer. Okay. Everybody in my relatives, they can sing. I can play bass. Gotcha. So I started learning early. If I'm going to be make me a spot, I better do because singing ain't going to be it. They could all sing me under the table. Right. But bass playing, I had them all. I had a spot. I knew I could get in. So now it became taking the bass and well, what else can I do with it? I started learning melodies all the time. I always learned melodies. Where were you? Where were you learning bass melodies from? Oh, I would hear, for instance, you know. Um, I would sit down and hear a tune and go, oh, God, Alfie, what's it all about, Alfie? And I, I would take splickets like that every day and just go, I might not even learn the whole tune, but I would learn that melody. Okay. I would listen to, the, I bet you the first melody I ever learned was probably um, People Get Ready, Curtis Mayfield. Okay. People Get Ready, Train, and Comment. I, I wrote an arrangement for bass. So you're, just, you're just ripping around the lyrical side. That's the melody. You're learning the melody. Okay. Absolutely. If you learn the melody, then it kind of expands your mind yeah. as a bassist and go, hmm, if she's playing that there, then I can play this over here against this, and it's going to sound good. Just like you have a guitar player going, choo, 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 but you got another guitar player going, dig it, dig it, dig it. Right. Dig it, dig it, dig it. It's two parts. It's two parts. And there's one song that I heard growing up that I was always blew me away. The, the best parts written is um, the tune that we started, Clean Up Woman. Are you familiar with this song? Okay. Clean Up Woman. Betty Wright. The guitar parts are just some of the best parts. I mean, they're perfect parts. You know, but you don't come across songs all the time that's got the perfect parts. Right. If you listen to that tune and then think about trying to play the intro without that intro, the song all of a sudden starts to fall flat. It's that setup of these, and I think there's three guitars on the front of it. Okay. Three different guitar parts. That's really started to open my mind up about what you could do with instruments if you take them and place them. And do them. But I never had the opportunity or the vehicle. And you didn't hear, you didn't get an opportunity to hear another bass player do it very often. That's either. very true. Not until did I was an adult. You, did you start studying any of like the lead bass players, like the Jakob Pastorius guy? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of Pastorius, Ron Carter, okay. Ray Brown. Right. Um, did you go, did you Did you flip, like did you Did you flip styles, like did you play slap bass, play, you know what I mean? Did you ever put a flat pick into your hand? I noticed you play with your fingers, which means you're a real bass player. I have put a, I have, <laughs> I have, I have, I have, I have used a pick for effect when I want to get a muted sound like this and go yeah. I, I'll use a pick, or I'll just use my thumb. Okay. And use it like a, like this, right. like a pick. But um, the pick sound is a sound all of its own, you know. And and I admire some. There's some really great pick players out here. But um, yeah, I started delving into all the styles and the techniques that they were using. But early on, it was it was really when it comes to basses and, and what you could do with it. Ron, a lot of upright players for me. Ron yeah. Carter, yeah, Ron Carter, Ray Brown. Niles Pedersen, Buster Williams. You ever mess around fretless? Oh, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I played cello in high school, too. Okay. So I like no frets. That doesn't bother me. Yeah. I'm a position player anyway. Well, and that's why I ask, because I can sort of tell by your technique that you, like, cause like I said, you're, you're solid jazz player. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a position player, and it's, it's all about being, memorizing the neck and being able to jump from one spot to another just because you... It's only seven notes. <laughs> okay, I always say that. So, but they're all they, they got positions, right. and so you. I just spent hours just looking at the instrument, looking. At, oh, that's a triangle. That's an L. This. Oh yeah, if you take this and make it like this, it's, it's like a seven. You see all these shapes. You read music. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then, how did you get into the shape stuff? Because usually you go one way or another. On that. Because because you're playing with a bunch of blues guys who don't read music. That's mm -hmm. absolutely correct. That's why. That, that's <laughs> and she can tell you. She man, did he hit a home run? Yes, he did. He a home run. <laughs> and and I and I say that because it's um, and it's not that they're not good. You know, as people get seen to get no. this they they get misguided when it comes to. Trying to be taught formally. Yeah, I'm not saying and, good and, or bad. I'm saying exactly. two different types. Yeah, it's just it's just a tool. That's yeah. all. One thing I can say about being educated formally 
your vocabulary is larger. Yeah. So you can communicate with more people. Mm -hmm. Even when I'm talking to some of these guys and they start talking to me about certain things they want to hear play, and I go, okay. I don't always have a clue because their language, if I haven't worked with them, I don't know what they mean. Right. So I go, okay, let me listen, let me listen. And pretty soon I'll just have them play it. I go, oh, you mean this? Then I know. And I can tell them what that is, you know. Just if you want to tell me this is, remember to tell, just tell me that. So basically, I'm educating them, but I don't want them to feel like threatened. Right. And a lot of them are threatened. A lot of these guys do get threatened, oh, yeah. you know. There's a big ego game in music, man. Yeah, they get, they really, they get really threatened. Yeah. If you learn to read, and I always give them an analogy about learning to read how it's a plus, not a minus, is that when you first came into the world, you did not read. But you learned everything with these. Mm -hmm. By the time you two or three, you done assembled some words together. But what's the first thing they teach you? So you can start to put words together and communicate beyond this. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. It's just that we, some of us just put a wall up and go, Oh, no, man, reading will hurt my plans. Just like reading a book will hurt your vocabulary? No, it is not. <laughs> it's not true. Is there really a really line you've heard reading yes. will hurt my plans? That is yes. the biggest bonehead fucking excuse yeah. I've ever heard in my and, life. And what I think it comes I've never from. heard a bigger excuse to not do some work in my life. Exactly. It's just a shame, AJ. And, and I think that they get it because sometimes they'll hear guys playing and they're reading and they think it's stiff. And I go, you got to hear it. I said, it may be stiff. I said, he might be stiff without the paper. Right. So reading's not the problem. The problem is he's not feeling what's on the paper. Mm -hmm. I said, I guarantee you, I can put something on right now. I bet you you can't tell me whether the guy's reading or not. I said, because the majority of the records that you listen to, if you get into the history of it, those guys were reading those charts. Yes. Yeah. And going, but this feels like this. See this right here? And you went and copied them. Especially the early days. The, the early, early days, days. Of blues, man. The, the, the bass players in the back line, those guys were hired guns that were there for... Oh, God. Yeah. Yes. And that's another good example of learn the craft if you want to be in the music business beyond your band being successful. Mm -hmm. If your band doesn't survive, that doesn't mean you can't survive. You can. You can still participate in this industry with the right training. Train yourself. You don't even have to go, you got the internet now. Yeah. You can learn anything you want to learn. Right. And go in and get it done. And you'll have more opportunity, you know. Are you, I don't know how to ask this. Sure you do. <laughs> Are you a kids these days kind of guy? Like, when you hear new music, when you, when you see the young kids that are coming up and they're playing, is there a complaint about their, how they're doing it wrong, or are you the type that looks at it and goes, oh, there's some new stuff happening here? I'm more of a some new stuff. Yeah? I'm more of a, I'm more of a oh, God, you, you're playing that? And I go, oh, man, that's, that's pretty good. What are you playing? Or I'll hear somebody, it's like, it's really interesting. I, you familiar with the band Snarky? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I had a guy play some of this, this for me a few years ago. I was playing it, and I go, oh, Brecker Brothers. And he looked at me and he went, who? Oh. I said, go back and listen to some old Brecker Brothers. And I said, you'll hear similarity. I said, I appreciate what they're doing. I said, I'm glad somebody found another vehicle for somebody to do something like this. And it was that band, because I did not know that band existed until somebody told me. Well, you know, it's funny about that. What was the song you guys were playing in there that you sang? I'd rather, I'd rather look blind. Up. So, you know, all I could hear while you guys were playing that was what? Blue Ain't My Color by Keith Urban. Oh. Exact same, it's the exact same song. So is Tennessee Witt. So is Tennessee Witt. Oh, yeah. and Tennessee Witt. Yep, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah 100%. Right. It's, it, but it's funny how it just keeps... And that's the one thing with the blues. It, it, blues has got a weird history in that everything about the blues has been stolen. Right. <laughs> like, everything about the blues has been stolen. Yes, right, man. because if you get too far out of the... The, the patterns that they recognize, then they tell you you're not, you're, that's not bluesy enough. Right. You know, the, the blues Nazis, we like to call them. <laughs> you know, say, no, that doesn't sound like blues. That doesn't sound like blues. But almost to the if point. you're trying to be different. But almost to the point where, like, it's the same songs. Yes. Or, which, which may be one of the major criticisms mm -hmm. of blues. People are doing the same songs. Just putting different words to Different words to yeah. it. Mm -hmm. But I always... Actually, that goes right back to the early history of blues, though, too. Yes, it does. Yeah. But, you know, I, I always think of um, 
Blues, one of the ways that people have a tendency to make a difference, first of all, I think that if you're a, a very gifted writer, things are gonna come out of you because what you bring in there and it comes back out of you, it's gonna be different. Okay, the, the one of the most famous things about blues is the call response. Yeah. Sing, play. Who's the master of that that had and has had tons of records? It's Clapton. It's his gift. Clapton plays, sings, then he plays. He sings, then he plays. You see? Are those what we call blues tunes? No, for the most part, his tunes are known as pop. Okay, right. Or rock and roll. Yeah. But where did he borrow from? Mm -hmm. And with coming through him, I think it's natural that he plays something and then sings. Mm -hmm. And it does not have to be a blues tone. It's just what he does. He's borrowed from the blues. In his, in his hands, it's a gifted person using all the tools. It's just, it's so interesting to me because when you get into the, like the legal side, like the, the mm -hmm. law side of copyright and all of that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And you start looking back on the history of music and how badly all the, you know, all the guys got ripped off coming all the way up, right, by, mm -hmm. by everybody all the way in. There's, there's like a piece of me, the more the more that I read that I go like, of course that's how it went down. It's part of the culture from the start of it. It was always about just passing it around. Yes. Do you have a perspective on that? I, I'm, there's no question there. It's just, it's something that's occurring to me as we're, as we're talking. No, not really. You're right. It always has been always passed around. I mean, and, and some of that stuff that we know as um, blues, that very, very simple format, is I learned that playing in church. Right. That's gospel. Some of the lines are a little different, but those changes, early gospel, Jesus is on the main line. Tell him what you want. But mm -hmm. Jesus is on one four. That's blues. It's one four. They borrow from one another. That's, that's a form of blues, I should say. That's not all blues, but sure. it's a form. Yeah. And for me, those early things of hearing where things were the same, it's been a plus and a minus for me, because guys will go, do you know such and such a song? And I go, no, how does it go? And they'll play it and go, oh, it's that kind of blues. Yeah. Because I was trained to learn concepts, not songs. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I've had an opportunity to see both of you play a couple of times. I've been impressed as hell every single Thank time. Thank you, AJ. Thanks. Uh, it's been a pleasure sitting and getting Aww. to know each of you. It's been each a pleasure AJ, what too. a great day, man. It's been so much fun. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, folks, that'll do it for this episode of the ABB Podcast. Make sure you check out the links below. we got links to these folks and, of course, our sponsors and everything else that we always put down there. And we got some videos coming up here. Click on those. Make sure you see them. I know one of them is going to be James Armstrong, so you're going to want to check yes. that out, too. See you next time. Good night. Good night. <laughs> That'll do it for this episode of the ABB Podcast. Don't forget you can subscribe to our full audio episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere you find your audio podcasts. The full episodes, highlights, and our live off-the-floor performance videos can be found at our YouTube channel, and you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at The AVB Podcast. Of course, you'll find links to our incredible sponsors and this week's guest in the description below. The AVB Podcast is part of the Border City Network. Find more great content at BorderCityNetwork.com. See you next time, folks. Bye-bye.